This is the Hogström 26. It's a Swedish made all vacuum tube amplifier cabinet. Hogström is a Swedish company probably most known for their guitars internationally, but they also made other instruments and audio equipment. So the problem with this unit is that it has excessive hum and we're going to try to figure out why that is. But first we'll take a look inside it. Okay, so let's get a quick overview. Here we have the mains transformer. Here we have the rectifier tube, which is an EZ80. Here we have an ECC83. This is used for the preamplifier and tremolo. Here we have the large electrolytic capacitors used for the power supply output. Here we have an EL84, which is used as the output tube. Here we have the output transformer. And here we have the speaker element. Now let's take a look at this part of the transformer, which I think is quite interesting. So this is the transformer that converts the mains voltage to a suitable operating voltage for the amplifier, as well as the heating element in the tubes. And here you have an interesting thing. You can see it's a spring-loaded piece of wire that is in turn attached to a small hook that you can detach. And this hook is attached to a small metal lump. And this is actually a heat fuse. So what happens is that if this transformer gets too hot, this piece of metal will also get too hot. And that will cause this solder joint to melt, which detaches the hook from this piece of metal. So what happens then is that this piece of wire detaches from the transformer, which opens the circuit. Thereby saving the transformer if it gets too hot. Now that is a very sensible design, since the mains transformer is one of the most expensive things to replace. Now the problem with this unit is excessive hum. And there is something that will make this troubleshooting process a bit more complicated. And that is that this unit was not delivered with its outer case. And you can tell that that might be a problem by looking at this copper tap. So the purpose of this tap is to ground the rest of the case. And that means that the rest of the case is used as a shield for electric fields. So the complication here will be to determine whether or not the hum comes from something that is wrong in the circuit or something that comes from the outside because of bad shielding. Now this serves as a good lesson. If you're doing a repair for someone else, make sure they deliver the entire unit to you and not just the part of the circuit that they think is broken. Because most of the time you will need the entire circuit to troubleshoot properly and to test it out when you're finished with the repair. When you're turning on old electronics for the first time, it's a good idea to use a variable transformer if you have one available and monitor the current as you turn up the voltage. And that is to try to avoid damaging anything in case, for example, there's a dead short in the unit. Okay, so there's quite a lot of hum. It seems like 50 Hz and it's overtones. Let's take a look underneath here. We'll start by removing the tube so we don't damage them. Now we have access to all the components in the circuit and we can see that the electrolytic capacitors has not been replaced. And given that this is from the 60s, I'm pretty sure that is what's causing the hum because electrolytic capacitors deteriorate over time. This is a simplified version of the power supply. You have the mains voltage plug which is connected to the input transformer which transforms the main voltage into a suitable operating voltage for the device. An output of this transformer is connected to a full bridge rectifier tube. Here we have the rectified output. So if you were to measure with an oscilloscope over these nodes, you would see something like this. Here we have voltage and time. So this is a rectified sine wave. So as you can see, this doesn't really look like a DC voltage. So what you do is you introduce a reservoir capacitor. 
So now the charges are stored in this capacitor. So when you're pulling current from the power supply, you're pulling the charges from the capacitor and not the power supply directly. So with no load, you will have a voltage that is basically completely DC. But then as you add a load, as you're pulling current from the power supply, you're pulling charges from this capacitor which discharges it. So when applying a load, you will get something that looks more like this. So here you can see the capacitor discharging, but it is recharged in the next cycle, and so it continues. And these variations in the DC voltage is called ripple. And you can reduce this ripple by adding a larger capacitance that can store more charges, so you get an acceptable ripple for your application. So what's happening with electrolytic capacitors as they dry out, you will have less capacitance and more current draw. So they are essentially turning into a resistor. So you will have less capacitance to store charges and more current will be drawn from the power supply. And so the ripple increases. And when this ripple gets too severe, it makes its way into the audio signal path. And that's why we get this hum. So what we need to do is replace the electrolytic capacitors, which will hopefully restore the voltage to its original specifications. So what we have to do is find all the electrolytic capacitors and replace them. So here is a list of the electrolytic capacitors that need to be replaced. And here are the capacitors with which we're going to replace them. Here are the capacitors that need to be replaced. This black one here. There's one on the other side of this board. And then we have the large metal can which is two capacitors in one. So here we have the positive terminals of the capacitors. And the negative terminal is the casing. So this is actually a screw-in capacitor, which means that to replace it, you just desolder the terminals and you remove the old one and you screw a new one back in place. If you would have an exact replacement part for this one, which is pretty hard to find nowadays. So these new capacitors will have to do. A lot of people like to keep these metal can capacitors for aesthetic purposes, so what I'm going to do is just cut the terminals and leave it in place. 
So there's a lot less hum now, but since the back shield is not in place, it's still susceptible to electric fields. So as you can see here, as I get close to the preamplifier tube, the hum increases. Okay, so there's some distortion that shouldn't be there. We'll have to find out what's causing that. Okay, so we have to do some actual troubleshooting as well. Nice. So I found this old schematic of the Hogstone 26 and one very nice thing here is that they've written out the bias voltage for the tubes. So that's a pretty good way to start troubleshooting. If any of the tubes are improperly biased, that could be the cause of the distortion. So let's start measuring the voltages and see if they match the schematic. The bias voltages match the schematic pretty well. I also checked the resistor values to make sure that the bias current of the tubes were correct and I couldn't find anything that deviated from the schematic. So I'm starting to suspect that it's something wrong with the speaker element. So let's connect it to a different speaker element and see if the distortion disappears. So I've now connected the amplifier to the speaker element of a second identical unit So here we get a distortion free signal, so there must be something wrong with the speaker element. There's no visual damage, so probably there's something wrong with the coil or the suspension. I would say finding the correct replacement part for this speaker element is a really hard thing to do. And if you want the original sound of this amplifier, you would need the original speaker element. So what you probably have to do is recone it. And that is not something that I am experienced enough to do. So for now I will try to replace it with another speaker element. So I plan on using the speaker element of this Grundig speaker. I want to point out that I think that this old style terminal design is much nicer than this more modern one. And the main reason for that is that every time I solder the wires to these terminals, I'm afraid that there's going to be some solder spill that drops down into the paper cone. And that is no risk when you're soldering these ones. And what I like to do when soldering these modern types of terminals is to place a piece of cloth underneath to catch any solder drops. <laughs> 
Thank you.